Our reading from the scriptures today comes from the Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter of Mark, and we begin at the 21st verse. Jesus and his followers went into Capernaum. Immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and started teaching. The people were amazed by his teaching, for he was teaching them with authority, not like the legal experts. Suddenly, there in the synagogue, a person with an evil spirit screamed, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One from God. Silence, Jesus said, speaking harshly to the demon. Come out of him. The unclean spirit shook the man and screamed. Then it came out. <laughs> Everyone was shaken and questioned among themselves, what's this? A new teaching with authority? He even commands unclean spirits and they obey him? <laughs> right away, the news about him spread throughout the entire region of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Always tell the truth. How many of us heard that as a child? Honesty is the best policy. The truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. And yet somewhere along the line, most of us got the message that the, that the whole truth was not truly to be included in that mandate. The preacher comes to visit and the mom says, would you like something to drink? We have tea and lemonade and Coca-Cola in the refrigerator. And the five-year-old pipes up from across the room, and don't forget beer, mommy. And he gets that look that says, we don't tell the whole truth. The Bible says, the truth shall set you free. And yet, somewhere this week, a supervisor will have to tell a room of nervous workers that the job is no more. The job that pays the rent and puts shoes on the kids is no more, and no one will feel set free. Someday, somewhere this week, a physician will have to walk into a hospital room and deliver the news that the diagnosis is cancer, inoperable, aggressive, and the truth will seem far from healing. Somewhere this week, across a kitchen table, a wife will look a husband in the eye and amidst tears will say, the drinking is out of control. I can't take it anymore. It's me or the bottle. And the one staring the consequences of addiction in the face may not believe that the truth is the pathway to freedom and healing. Our scripture passage this morning is about truth. In today's gospel, Mark chapter one, Jesus is in the city of Capernaum teaching in the synagogue. The scripture says that the congregation is shocked. They are in awe, in awe of his teaching. Perhaps they had read in last week's bulletin that there was going to be a guest speaker and and the folks had debated whether to even show up for service that day. The, the regular preacher's away and he's probably got some boring lay speaker to fill in or worse yet, a Gideon who's gonna tell those same old st tired stories and expect an offering afterwards. But those who decided to come that day have quite a surprise. Their encounter with Jesus leaves them awestruck. In contrast to their usual teachers, Jesus speaks and acts with an authority that is undeniable. 
What is it that Jesus says that so astounds his audience? We don't know. Not a word of Jesus' teaching is remembered here in Capernaum. Whatever it was that impressed his listeners is not written down for us to hear. In other places in the Bible, Jesus' teachings may be remembered. In, in some Bibles, you know, everything Jesus said is printed in red. Yet, yet it's rather odd that in Mark's gospel, where Jesus is called so frequently the teacher over and again by his disciples, by the crowds, by the Pharisees and the Herodians, very few of, of Jesus' teachings are remembered in Mark. In Mark, there's no Sermon on the Mount, as, it, as there is recorded in Matthew, nor do we find parables like there are in Luke. We will never know what it was that Jesus taught. We only know how he taught with authority. And where did he, where did he get his authority? Was it from the position he held or from the educational level he had achieved or the honors he had been awarded? Jesus had none of these. Remember, Jesus is, is the son of a peasant carpenter family. He holds no advanced degrees. His resume is pretty thin. He's been the pastor of no prestigious churches or taught at any renowned universities. His authority cannot be measured by the number of framed diplomas he has hanging on his office wall, nor does the result of any impressive titles he holds or the amount of salary package he receives. His authority is revealed in an encounter with the unclean spirits or demons found lurking in everyday life, even at the church. Right there in the middle of the service, perhaps in the middle of the sermon, there erupts a wild voice, disruptive, disjointed, crazy. Where are the ushers? Who is this man? What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? His shouting drowns out the preacher. Have you come to destroy us? And we look around and there's only one man shouting, I know who you are, the Holy Son of God. And the preacher comes down from the pulpit, departing from whatever text he had prepared and confronts the man or the demons. Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, crying with a loud voice, comes out of the man. Now, ever since the first century, Christians have struggled to define just what these unclean spirits are. Some have said these spirits or demons were first century attempts to define mental illness. Others have said that some supernatural power is at work here and that we should not define away demonic possession. Various symbols have been used to represent demons, everything from creepy little rat-like gremlin creatures to slithering snakes to sharp-toothed growling wolves as C.S. Lewis displays them in his mythical world of Narnia. Or in the case of the Queen of Evil, C.S. Lewis pictures her as a pale-faced, white-haired witch who freezes the world around her with her chilling presence. All of these symbols convey, convey a common theme. The evil around us and in us is dangerous and destructive and can be all-consuming. I tend to think that the unclean spirits or demons we see in our world are those things which control our lives and separate us from the loving source of our being. We see in our world the demons of addiction, the demons of greed, the demons of jealousy, the demons of power, hunger. Whenever and however we are possessed by something or someone which keeps us from giving and receiving love, it's then we find unclean spirits in charge. The troubling part of facing unclean spirits is that those spirits are often not contained within just one individual life, but can contaminate a, a group and can destroy a community. 
Evil loves division and thrives on dishonesty and falsehoods. Unclean spirits can be like the weeds which choke out the flowers in the garden or the cancerous tumor which steals needed nutrition from the healthy cells. Jesus displays his authority in the way that he takes on the unclean spirits. Jesus does an interesting thing here. He neither ignores the unclean spirit, as many of us are prone to do, just live in denial, nor does he become impatient with them, letting frustration dictate his response. But he certainly does not allow the unclean spirits to take him captive. He confronts them head on. He does so by speaking the truth and by, more importantly, being the truth. For unclean spirits cannot dwell in the company of the truth. Like with many things, our world seems to have a rather distorted understanding of truth. In our media crazed world, too often the truth is seen as a weapon to destroy. A greed-driven, highly profitable industry has emerged out of creating scandal by uncovering dirt, particularly on public personalities. One of the reasons I think we have such trouble finding people with integrity to run for political office is that Folks don't want to put themselves and their families through what has been called the, the politics of personal destruction. Attempts made in the name of truth to find out and reveal embarrassing information about public officials. And let me say, both political parties on all sides are guilty of that practice. It was the same practice used against Jesus. In the name of religious truth, the so-called authorities attempted to pin Jesus into a corner and publicly embarrass him, but they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it because Jesus is the undeniable truth. And the truth Jesus speaks is at one with the truth that Jesus lives. And the truth Jesus proclaims is not a truth that destroys, but a truth that heals. The disturbed man in our story today is delivered. He's, he's healed by meeting the truth face to face. Our world often equates truth with correct belief or dogma. And those who have the right beliefs are included and those who think outside of the box are excluded. Now in this understanding, truth is something to be mastered or managed. But Jesus brings a truth that moves us not toward exclusion, but toward inclusion. Jesus' truth values persons over rules and traditions. Jesus' truth cannot be controlled. Jesus' truth cannot be contained in a slogan or a bumper sticker or a few bullet points on a religious track. For Jesus is the truth, the truth who heals. I don't think it'd be exaggerating to say that every single family I've ever come into contact with, including my own, has some degree of dysfunction, some possessive unclean spirit in our midst. Now in psychological terms, we sometimes call it the family secret. Mama drinks too much and pops a lot of pills, but we explain it away by saying, well, she's under a lot of stress. Brother may be a rageaholic who everybody just tiptoes around trying to not upset. Uncle Joe may be drowning in debt because he's trying to spend his way out of an unhappy marriage. Cousin Steve may live a comfortable lifestyle but regularly cheats in his business interactions and lies on his taxes. Sister Bonnie is jealous of Sister Betty and regularly looks for ways to bring her down and and little Bobby can't sit still in class at school because at home, Mama and Daddy are fighting all the time and he's found that if he's the class clown, his hurt goes away for just a time. Now, the, the names of the situations I just mentioned, they're all fictitious. 
and any connection to reality is purely coincidental. But if what I describe rings at all familiar with any of your experience, then maybe Jesus has something to offer us. And the community called together in Jesus' name, we ought to have something to offer, folks. And that is the truth. Not a truth which destroys, but a truth which heals. Not a truth which condemns, but a truth which heals. Not a truth which exposes people to embarrassing things, but a truth which heals. Let's pray together. O oh, blessed Lord Jesus, you ministered to all who came to you. Look with compassion upon us today. Deliver us from the unclean spirits who destroy our health and steal our freedom. Restore us to sanity and to wholeness with the gift of your unfailing mercy. Remove from us the fears that claim us. Strengthen us in the work of our recovery. And give us all patience and understanding and persevering love. In your name we pray. Amen.